thanks to Wes and Dave and the crew here at Cal State Long Beach for having me here. Um, I've come home, so to speak. I'm, um, I'm really happy to kind of be here and do something fun with you. You guys will probably walk out of here being uh, a little exhausted. A lot of you have probably had classes all day, but um, hopefully this will kind of get you a little bit energized and excited. Um, I'm going to spend about the first um, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe 25, and I'm just talking a little bit about who I am so you can understand that a little bit in context. Um, I'm going to uh, sort, of, sort of introduce myself, and then I'm going to sort of talk about some opportunities and design process that is going to be relevant to what you're going to be doing here this evening. I'm going to show you some examples of what I've done that puts into practice some of the stuff that you're going to be doing this evening. And then we're going to, you guys are all going to take part in an idea storm. So we spent about a half an hour on the first three things and about two hours on the last part. Yeah. Okay. So you'll see on your tables, you've got post-it notes, you've got sharpies, you've got little dots, sticky dots. All of you are, strangely enough, sitting next to a wall. Okay? You brought tape and you bought, brought scissors, so there's going to be some interesting things that you do with all of those props that you've got on your table. Plus, we have an array of things here that you can come up and use. There's colored paper, there's pipe cleaners. You know? Probably have played with those since you were about four. But and there's binder clips, there's weird little squares of tissue paper, colored pencils, foamy weird sheets of stuff, other mark colored markers, more dots, more post-it notes if you need them. So there should be plenty of supplies to go around to keep you guys active. So with that, I'm going to jump into kind of talking about who I am and what my background is. So I think what Wes didn't tell you is that I actually graduated from here at Cal State Long Beach a very long time ago. I'm actually from Southern California. I grew up in Santa Barbara and Ventura and San Diego and went to college here. So a good part of my life was spent down here, so I kind of feel at home a little bit here. Um, but when I left Cal State Long Beach, I did a lot of interesting things. Um, I went and worked for clients, big clients, little clients. I went to work for corporations consulting firms, um, I've worked in here in the United States, I've worked in Mexico, I've worked in Europe, I've worked in Mongolia, I've worked in Costa Rica, Colombia, and I've lived in a lot of places over the world. So, and during that time, and like this is my, like part of my life in a nutshell, which is kind of scary, so a lot of the professional design work that I've done has been focused on the medical products industry, designing really complex systems like how to be able to move hospital equipment from the floor to the ceiling of a hospital. Um, how to design hospital equipment and dental equipment that makes it easier for the dental technicians and the radiologists and all the different people who work around a patient to be able to move around the patient. To the world's first, which is I'm very proud to announce is this top left one, the world's first HIV AIDS testing kit. So before HIV and AIDS was a problem, they kind of were figuring it out in the laboratory, and at some point they decided they needed to commercialize it so they could send it out to all over the country, all over the world, so you could test people's blood to see if there was HIV. And that was one of the very first ones that came from the lab and that was turned into more of a commercial product. Um, moving along to kind of sports products, like you know, one-hand operated clip systems for bike helmets, to child safety seats for companies that, for a company that prior to us getting involved, they had only bought their baby seats from some manufacturer in China and slapped their logo on it. They then wanted to design and develop and manufacture their own child safety seat. To crazy kind of weird one-use surgical tools, this one is for taking this little thousand, multi-thousand dollar piece of tubing, it's called a stent, it goes inside of a vein to open up the vein to allow blood to flow through more easily. Um, for being able to apply that stent to that wire in front of it so that the surgeon can insert it into the human and get it into their vein. And that, that green and yellow device is used by the surgeon to clamp the stent onto the guide wire, roll it and crimp it on without damaging the multi-thousand dollar stent, and then delivering it into the patient, expanding the balloon that's over the wire and pulling the wire out. And that product's used once, and then it's tossed away. 
So kind of weird sort of consumer electronic products for Silicon Valley. This is a fraction of some of the stuff that I've worked on, but I come from a very traditional background in industrial design, designing products. It's what you guys are all learning how to do. Um, at some point a few years ago, I had an opportunity to do a project with Procter & Gamble. And I, I got students involved with it. And I started to look at ways to be able to apply the design process to things that weren't products, that were sort of big problems. And so we were asked and given money to identify a problem somewhere local to us. And so we identified a problem in the Central Valley of California. And for me, that was really kind of an interesting problem because, I, as I said, I grew up in San Diego. My parents' house was on the eastern side of South San Diego. And my backyard, my fence, I could stand at it and look over thousands of acres of ranch land with not a building in sight. The only thing that I ever got to do was see migrant workers coming from Mexico up through Otay Ranch, walking along our fence line, heading up to the Central Valley farmlands to be able to work. And so while my friends were out on the street selling lemonade, I was handing out water and sandwiches to the migrant farm workers. So somehow or other, my past came back to visit me on this project. We focused on farm workers in Central Valley of California. We focused on the system that they live and work within. So this is a complex system and it's, it, it, it doesn't include everything, but this is the type of system that exists when, when you, that, that's behind the apple that you buy in the store, or actually probably better, the tomato or the carrot or the strawberry that you buy in the store. There's this huge system behind it that made that strawberry appear in the store. There's food producers, the big ones, Kellogg, Dole, Kraft, ConAgra, General Mills, all those big companies that put all that stuff on the shelves. They work with the growers. The growers work with, uh, you know, like Diamond and Sunsweet. The growers work with the federal government, other universities, UC Davis. They work with the agricultural commissioner. The growers employ farm labor contractors in California who are report to the California EPA government systems and to Cal OSHA, which is also an, a, a, a government system. And they employ crew leaders, which then hire, at the time that we did this, 2.1 million farm workers a year in California to put that strawberry in the store so you could eat it. So really, really complex systems evolved. And when we were working on this project, we started to actually also employ some different methodologies of trying to understand more about what the problem was. And so we worked extensively with people in the community. We met with people who lived in the town of Early Mark. We visited households. We spent time living with them. We interviewed them. We went into the fields with them. We really tried to see what their life was like. And through that, we, that we discovered that they were under, they were experiencing huge amounts of exposure to pesticides. When you talk to any of the companies that produce pesticides, they go, but the pesticides aren't dangerous. How many of you would shower in pesticides? You had a choice. You could turn on your shower, turn on water, or turn on pesticides. Which would you do? Water, water right? That's a no-brainer. So we're like, OK, that's great that you can't prove that there's a problem, but it's clear that there are issues. And one of the big problems that we found is that pesticides in the field actually end up in the home. When the farm workers in the field working, they end up bringing their clothing home. They sit on the couch. Their baby sits on the couch. Their baby's face goes on the couch. It licks the couch, the hands, whatever it is. And then they take all the clothes off and they put it in their washing machines and they wash all their clothes together. The baby's clothes, the children's clothes, the parents' clothes, the work clothes all get washed together. Water enhances pesticides in some cases. So there was this like really weird sort of system that we were seeing. So we kind of spent a lot of time trying to understand it, ended up developing, developing some conceptual projects that we presented to Procter & Gamble that would sort of contemplate the possibility of creating protective clothing <coughs> for the farm workers, kind of like a uniform, like a flight attendant has or like your doctor has 
along with integrating sensing technologies so that the farm worker would know when pesticides were coming or when they were present so that they could take action to try to alleviate the problem. So, when I did this project, I started to realize that there was a lot more complex problems out there. And I started to realize that design can be really, really, really powerful. And this is like a quick illustration of kind of my world view of what designers are. Notice how they span all the different disciplines, engineering, business, society, social sort of issues, culture, NGOs, which is non-government organizations, if you don't know, including government organizations. And we kind of cross through all of them. And so I kind of like to think about designers and design as a process as glue. We glue a lot of other things together. And so by doing that project with Procter & Gamble and starting to think a little bit more, I started to realize that there was some real interesting opportunities out there in the world. And what I, well, you may have heard this terminology before. They're called wicked problems. Anybody heard that term before? Wicked problems? A wicked problem is a problem that it's, it's kind of simple. It's kind of really a hard, hard, hard problem. And a good example is you look at this and you go, it's a screw. But what the real problem is, is somebody just wants a hole. So your client comes to you and they say, I want a hole. They don't tell you they want a screw. Screws don't exist anywhere. And they just say to you, I want a hole. There's multitudes of ways that you can make that hole. And the screw may or may not be the answer, but this is sort of the beginning of what a wicked problem is. And so wicked problems are everywhere. What's an example of a wicked problem that you can think about? Knowing that he's looking at the Procter & Gamble issue and the things that we were sort of discovering, what's something that you guys can think of that is a wicked problem? Yeah? Possibly, are you thinking like world hunger? World hunger, it's a huge problem. It's complex. It's not like something that you could really solve quite easily. There's a lot of different stakeholders involved. There's a lot of different responsible people involved. What else? Any other kind of problem that you can think of that's a wicked problem? Homelessness. Homelessness is a wicked problem, yeah. Climate change. Climate change, wicked, yeah, they're, they're problems. And you know, can designers help in all of these? That would be great, wouldn't it? Because we'd all be employed forever. So one of the things about working on wicked problems is you have to ask the right questions. There are different questions that you might ask from, it, it, you know, in comparison if you're designing the newest cell phone for the market. They're just different types of questions you're going to ask. You have to get to know the real lives of the people that you're going to be designing for and what their needs are. And you have to look at the problem sideways. And I think that's really important. You can't just replicate what you've done before when you're doing the design work because it's not a normal problem that you're trying to solve. Our brains are built to create patterns but in order to attack wicked problems successfully, we have to break those patterns to be able to open up new and relevant solutions. So for example, this is one of my favorite stories. This is a street scene in Paris. These are uh, the guys who clean the gutters. They don't hire machines to do it. They don't have street sweepers that go up and down their streets. They hire people and employ them. And they give them these brooms. And these brooms are the new brooms. The old brooms used to literally be twigs tied together that looked exactly like this. So imagine instead of them being green, they were brown. The guys still all dressed the same and they walked around with twigs sweeping the street. I used to live over there and I would watch this and I would go, what? This, this is crazy. And then I went back a few years later and what did I see? They had gotten new brooms, but they looked just like the old ones. So somebody hadn't really thought about the problem of cleaning streets in Paris. They just replicated what was there before. So establishing the context in which you're going to be working in is something that we're going to be doing kind of this evening. I'm going to be talking to you about that more. Defining a focus, generating ideas, prioritizing and selecting, and improving and building. These are some of the things that you need to really think about when you are attacking wicked problems. And that's kind of like a very quick overview of it because I really kind of want to move things along a little bit. So what I'm going to try to do is give you a few other examples of work that I've done in this realm. Um, but I think to be clear, you need to understand my perspective. I've lived for more than two and a half years 
in other parts of the world where people struggle. So I've lived with low-income families in different parts of the world, in Central America, in Mexico, in South America, in Colombia, in Cameroon, in rural China, in Mongolia, and I've seen the world through their eyes. My worldview is very different than most people's. And through that experience of doing this work and working with these people, I have been able to really craft a very unique perspective on the power of design. So I'd like to share three quick examples with you of some of the work um, that I've been involved with. This is some work that I've been doing over the last few years. It kind of took a break for a couple of years, but it's now coming back to life with a community in uh, Lebialum. Lebialum is in, I guess, Little Vision. This is Africa. That's Cameroon. This is Cameroon. That's Lebialum. I don't know. It's like the size of New Jersey, maybe. Maybe a little bit bigger, but it's in the middle of nowhere. It's filled with, I'm going to go back one, it's filled with colorful people, culture that you have no idea about. I understand the king, chief, sub-chief, female chief. I am Mafwa Ndinguala. I am a female chief in Lebialum. I understand the responsibilities of a chief. I think it's weird, but I understand why they have 23 wives. I understand what that structure is. I understand what their daily life is like. I understand where they live and what they do during the day. They're farmers. Most of the people that live in rural parts of the world are small one-acre farmers. If any of you have an opportunity to ever read any of the work that Paul Pollock has done and reads any of his books, um, Out of Poverty is one of them. He's probably lived similarly to me in weird parts of the world for probably 10 years of his life. So he's like the master of understanding what rural communities um, go through. In, in Levi Alam, they are farmers. Um, they walk everywhere. There's motorcycles starting to come into the region, but most of the roads look like that. There's no paving. Um, there's like one electrical line that goes into the main town, and sometimes there's electricity, and sometimes there isn't. So imagine what it's like when you go home and you flip the light, and you actually don't know whether it's going to go on or not. Because most of the time it doesn't go on, so most of the time you just leave it off. That's what it's like in places like this. It's very different from what we do. They have markets where they sell their food, they have crafts, people who work with metals, but a lot of it is sort of what we de would define as very primitive. They all have cell phones. Okay, so they know how to communicate with each other and do things with cell phones. So what we focused on is putting the disparate pieces together. We worked with the farmers, the blacksmith, local companies that made bikes or made products out of bicycle tubing, and the motorcycle owners. And what we were able to do is we're starting to work on developing some products that help them to transport more goods from their farm to the market. If you look at this lower right image, the guy on the left, he's carrying a basket on his head. That's normally what the women carry around from the farm to the market to deliver their food to be sold. Most of the women of my age in that, in that area are walking around like this. Most of the time. And all, all of them. Because they've been carrying loads of food on their heads, screeching their necks down, bending their backs over, and they're disfigured. They have health problems. And so what we've been working with them on doing is recreating different ways to be, be able to carry the food safely, the agricultural goods safely from the farm to the market, and so they can carry more safely. If they can carry more food to the market, they can sell more, they can earn more. The solutions also employ the blacksmiths, so instead of just making funny little bells for the king for ceremonies and a shovel here and there, they can start crafting an industry around creating these products. Now they're very simple and they're very crude, but they work. And they're really, they're really strong and the blacksmiths can make them. So another quick example is some work I've been doing in Costa Rica, very different. Um, I was hired by the Ministry of Culture, the Museum of Contemporary Art and Design, or Design and Art, an Artisan Guild, and the National Tourism Board 
to go in and work with an artisan community in Costa Rica. Excuse me. So what I've been doing for the past five years is working with them in different stages, running innovation workshops, work, running sustainable, sustainability workshops, working one-on-one -on -one with the artisans. Um, and what has come of that, I'm going to show you three examples. One of them is um, the first workshop I ran focused on collaboration. So I taught these artisans and walked them through different exercises to learn how to collaborate together because they really didn't know how to. And so we put artisans together that had never worked together, that worked in different materials, and the end results are two success stories. This one is the story of Luis on your left and his two partners. One owns a bed and breakfast and the other one is a tour guide. Luis is a painter. He's a traditional painter who paints these beautiful wood panels and wood ox carts that nobody uses anymore. And he was struggling trying to figure out how am I going to use, how am I going to use my talent to continue to make a living. So he was able, after the collaboration workshop, to pull together these people and they've built a sustainable cultural tour business in the town of Sarchi that works with the nearby capital of San Jose, um, Costa Rica, and brings kids, students from San Jose, foreigners from San Jose, and teaches them all about biodynamic uh, coffee plantations, uh, how to be able to paint like Luis does, and they've created a whole business out of that one workshop. Um, this guy here is another one. This is uh, Rolando, and Rolando is a sweet guy. He's like every one guy that you meet in a village that all the villagers say, that's okay, you don't have to listen to Rolando. He's gonna be crazy. <laughs> He's drunk half the time, whatever, but he can paint like crazy. So in this workshop, he was paired up with a woodworker. And okay, it's an umbrella. An umbrella exists, right? But somehow or other, Rolando was able to see how to put together an umbrella, his painting, and custom-made handles for the umbrellas. In four years, he's quadrupled his income. He's met the president of Costa Rica. He's on television at all sorts of events. People invite him to hand out his umbrellas to guests. He has changed his life. He's no longer the town drunk. Nobody calls him crazy anymore. So it's a simple umbrella, but it made a huge difference. And then the last uh, one I'm going to show you is, a, is, a, is another uh, project from uh, Costa Rica. And this one I'm going to run through quickly. It's with the artisans again, some wood producers that have sustainable teak forest farms, and also um, have a teak flooring fabrication plant and the government. And you know, most of the um, artisans, the woodworking artisans in Sarchi have wood shops that look like this. They're like little factories. And they can crank out wood products like you wouldn't believe. Most of it is like endangered, forested, you know, illegally forested hardwoods. So we went, I went in and, and taught them about how to use uh, sustainably forest teak wood, but on top of that, not just any teak wood, scrap wood from the flooring manufacturer that used to be burnt. They would just take it out and back in their factory and burn it and add lots of pollution to the air. So we worked out a deal that the, the teak flooring manufacturer would sell the scrap wood. So the teak flooring manufacturer would make money because they, would use, they used to just burn it. They would sell the scrap to the artisans at a low, low, low cost. So the artisans would save money, they wouldn't have to spend as much on the materials. And we worked out a way to be able to use those scraps, some of which were about this long, some of which were this long, about this wide, to work with the wood to create a whole set of, a whole bunch of products for a new company starting up in Costa Rica. So a lot of these sort of wood products are products that I've worked on with the artisans and they just started being sold last October. It's a, new, it's a new brand that Okra is offering and it's doing really well. So um, those are like three stories from Costa Rica and I'm running out of time so I wanna really zip through this last one. And this is just this work I'm doing now. And this is in Colombia. I'm working with an organization in Colombia on the right, Mahavir Camina. It's a clinic that fits prosthetics. Uh, at no cost to the children and adults that come in that are amputees, that are either victims of snake bites, that's the big deal, 
uh, diabetes, motorcycle accidents, or landmines. Um, I have developed the Simple Limb uh, initiative, which I work with um, designers and my students, and we develop um, prototypes, put them up on an open source environment online, and people from all over the world can access the build plans for the prototypes. Uh, for the prosthetics and they can make them themselves, they can improve on them. We're in the process of getting it uh, classified as, um, uh, what's it called? Open source, it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, so the website is going through a shift right now and getting more work put up and some, I, we're working on a whole new round of products right now specifically with Mahadra Kamina. Mahavir Kamina gets art, uh, amputees that come in with these on their legs, usually. They're pretty scary looking, although some of them are kind of cool. This one has really beautiful artwork on it. And this one weighs like 35 pounds. So I don't even know how they walked around. But this one's made from old motorcycle parts. Yeah, they were like crazy. And they walk out with brand new legs. Uh, Mahavir Kamina works with an organization in India BMVSS, who has developed a system for making prosthetics that's very cost effective. But Mahavir Kamina is looking for a way to make them more cost effective because they don't charge the amputees for their prosthetics, they give them away. Mahavir Kamina is set up as a nonprofit. All of their income comes from donations and from grants from the government. So we're working with them, cycling through lots of different prototypes to test out different ways of making the sockets that fit onto the stump of the amputee, different types of knees that can be made, different, type, different ways of making feet that more, are more adaptable to the Colombian terrain. And we've come up with some, um, okay, that's weird. Yeah, that slide disappeared, that's okay. So we've come up with some interesting <coughs> concepts. One, one time we worked on arms, but we've kind of more focused on legs right now. So this is the most recent round of some of the prototypes that actually work. This one right now is being tested down in Colombia. It costs like $18 to fabricate. So, and it's not bad looking, right? So it's a process because traditionally prosthetics are, are designed to either function incredibly well, like high tech, carbon fibers, like heavy duty, like knees that like you can climb Mount Whitney with, and they're also designed, so they either look really technical, like a scary mechanical, or they kind of look like a leg or an arm, but not really, so they're kind of creepy looking, right? So everybody has experienced that when you see an amputee, and you look, and you look, and you try not to look, and then you look a little bit more, and they can see you doing that, right? They're not blind, right? They just have a limb missing, and some kids are great, kids like stare, and stare and stare, and then the parent goes, stop staring, and pulls them away, and then nobody talks to the amputee. So what if an amputee can have like really cool looking prosthetics that they can afford and that work? So this is kind of another project that I'm working on right now. So it's like, it's a different way of thinking about design. It's this, this one is sort of, you know, it's challenging because trying to design a prosthetic for $30 or less is not easy your choice of materials dwindles quite quickly. Um, carbon fiber just goes out the window, forget it, you can't do that, but you get to start to experiment with different materials that you can use too. So, that's kind of the background that, about me and sort of where this sort of whole idea about trying to use design to do good in the world came from. Um, you all had um, an assignment to watch a movie before you came here tonight. Hopefully you all had a chance to watch that. Yeah? Yeah? Good, because if you didn't, this is going to be an interesting evening. Um, so now I'm going to talk about what we're going to do next. And now this is the attention shifts to you and your brains. Okay? So we're going to go through what's called an idea storm. And how many of you, a lot of you have been involved in brainstorming sessions, right? Just standard brainstorming sessions. And you sit around and you talk, and somebody always says, that's a stupid, terrible idea, right? Well, this is the standard process for ideas. That's a terrible idea. It's a good idea, but it's not going to work. 
I knew it was a good idea all along. And, you know, Arthur C. Clarke has to know what he's talking about. So, and this is true. You'll see this over and over again in the product development cycle. So, an idea storm has similar rules to a, any sort of standard brainstorming session. We're going to go through four exercises, if we can, this evening. Okay? You have all the tools on the table. You watch the film. Some things that you need to realize when you're working. Everybody at the table has to participate. You have to build on ideas and don't critique them. So there's no bad ideas. You have to turn off that little negative beep, 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 voice in your head and stuff it away for the next two hours. You can't say anything negative at the table. Quantity is really important because going through product, going through concepts very, very, very fast and not sticking to one concept for too long really helps your brain to really come up with some interesting ideas that you didn't know were there. You want to write and draw everything that comes out of your mouth. And there's different ways that you can do that. You can talk and somebody can record and draw and write. You can't all sit there quietly and just draw. This room is going to be noisy. Nobody's going to be able to hear anything. So there's got to be conversation going on. You have to be participating. You have to be talking together. You need to be pushing each other. It needs to be a really focused endeavor for the next two hours. How many of you in here practice sports? Please more than one person raise their hand. Uh, video gaming. Okay. You know how you can do video games for hour upon hour upon hour and you're like not exhausted? Do it here tonight. Okay. So there are different topics that are that, that were problems that were presented in that film, right? You know, access to clean water was an issue. Uh, nutrition, basic nutrition was an issue. You know, not just for the young wealthy Americans that were down there, but for all the people that lived in Penyamunca and in other villages like that all over the world. Um, disaster always happens. I mean, we experience disasters, but we have the infrastructure to deal with them most of the time. Regular employment is an issue. Uh, money, having money coming in, managing money, understanding how to manage money and finances is a problem. And of course, getting education for you, their, their, their kids. So these were some of the real key, big, wicked problems that exist in Kenya Blanca. So wicked problems aren't the property of urban, high-tech industry. They exist in very sort of uh, simple and uh, lovely parts of the world also. So, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting an exercise called Head and Heart. Head and Heart is a way for you to think about a simple issue and think about it both from a very kind of logical point of view, but also from an emotional point of view. Because when you're designing for people, they're not machines. People have brains and people have hearts. And you have to pay attention to both of them. So your team should be thinking about the needs of the customer, the persona that you chose. And you need to force consideration. And I mean it. You need to force consideration as you're working on this assignment for functional, emotional, and intellectual needs. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be using that piece of paper that's on the wall. You're going to be. Um, Imagine that that small sheet on your wall is this big, right? So you can use the wall all around and imagine there's a horizontal line that goes much wider than is on that little piece of paper and extends out. And you can use the area above and the area below. You have a bunch of post-its on your table. You have lovely Sharpie pens so that you can see what it is that you are writing really clearly <laughs> once you put it up on the wall. Um, this represents a life-size image of a body. Place the sticky notes with thoughts about needs and goals, aspirations and fears, and other emotions or perceptions in the respective areas. And I'm gonna tell you about what in a second, so just hold on a second. Um, so the body image is divided, like I said, into the head, which is the analytical side, and the heart, which is the emotional side. You can also draw little images. It doesn't have to be just words. So use your designer skills to illustrate and visualize what you're thinking in your head. And you know, right now, your sheet of paper on the wall looks like this. 
but eventually it's going to look like that and hopefully <coughs> that even though. Good. So, you know, what you start to do when you engage in an exercise like this, you think when you separate it into this analytical and emotional, it starts to help you really understand how people think about products and experiences and everything in their life. They're not just robots. But what's also interesting is that you can really focus in on one discrete item and really come up with some thoughts about it that you really probably would have thought, thought about if you just thought, sat there and went, water, what can I think about, right? So it's a way to kind of open up your brain a little bit. So everybody did great. I've been looking at the stuff on the walls. There's a lot of kind of interesting thoughts going on there. So now I'm going to launch you into your second exercise. So these are going to come at you like crazy tonight. So the second exercise, I went around and I put two pieces of paper on everybody's table. You've got to flip them over now. And every you've got a picture, you've got a picture, and you got another sheet. So, so don't read the paper yet. Just look at the picture. Try to figure out what the picture is. In some cases, it's hard to understand. So, the entry. Oh, I can the item. Can I start one? So, what you're going to do is you're going to draw inspiration from seemingly unrelated objects to encourage fresh perspectives, incite original thinking, and develop new ideas. So, you guys haven't been assigned a focus area yet, but it's going to be different than the one that you were just looking at. And you've been given a random object. I'm, I'm holding back from the focus area for right now. What I'd like you all to do is the first half of that sheet, the top half. I would like you to look at those images, and I want you to write down on your sheet or on post-it notes, if that's easier, so you can put them up on the wall. And I want you to write down words associated with the random object or image. So the random object here was butterflies. The words that they came up with were delicate, fluttering, colorful, metamorphosis, graceful, quiet, cocoon, insect, leaf, fly, okay? Then, what's gonna, then what happens is you're going to be given a focus area. In this case, it was home as sanctuary. Um, and so they came up with like, ideas that can be brought about by associating some of these words with the area that you're assigned. The sound dampening room dividers that change the space nature scenes of artwork on the wall with LCDs. So this is just an example. So you had an object that you were given. You have a number of words that you've associated. And now what I would like you to do is come up with some concepts for cooking at home, thinking about your persona. Whoever you chose, think about them cooking at home and think about, you know, look at those words. I would. I would say focus more on the image and the focus area at this point in time and think about cooking at home in Guatemala in general. That might be easy, right? So this next one is called um, provocation. So provocation is doing something like it's using an unusual statement or stimulus to provoke creative thinking. So for example, what could be changed about a restaurant, and this is totally unrelated to what Guatemala. But what could be changed at a restaurant if we question what we take for granted? So for instance, what if a restaurant only made one thing? And that's all they made. And you're seeing a lot of that now, right? I live near a restaurant that specializes in macaroni and cheese. A really good restaurant and that's all they do. Uh, what if a restaurant was completely dark and you couldn't see anything? Those, those do exist. You go in, it's pitch black, you can't see your hand in front of your face. You consume food without seeing what you're eating. You can't see your waiter, you can't see the person you're talking to. What if a restaurant was underwater? Yes, they exist. What if a restaurant was up in the air? This is exists. That's like $20,000 this table in Paris, but it, is, it does exist. What if the restaurant was in the toilet? <laughs> oh my. Yeah, I yeah. 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 Yeah.
ones in the other house? What if a restaurant didn't stay put? So what if it was a moving restaurant? Change location. So I'm going to give you a focus area, and you're going to do the first thing you're going to do, and I'm going to tell you what that focus area is in a second. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to list what you take for granted about the focus area. Number one. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to remove, reverse, or exaggerate what's taken for granted. Okay? So you're then going to, out of those, pick the two oldest provocations, and you're going to write those down below, and, we'll, and then you're going to come up with some ideas, things that might come, come to your mind using those provocations. So for example, types of provocations are, you could remove something. You could cancel, drop, remove, or deny what has been taken for granted. For example, in the terms of the restaurant, we don't serve food. Okay? And what kind of ideas could you come up with for a restaurant that doesn't serve food? You could reverse something around. So you could reverse the normal flow or direction or of action. For example, the diners serve the waiters. Right? So that's a different way of thinking about it. You can exaggerate the normal quantity or scale. For example, we have one million seats. Or we have one seat. Okay? So, um, again, I'm going to give you a focus area. You're going to list what you take for granted about that focus area. And then you're going to remove, reverse, or exaggerate what's taken for granted and make a list of those about that, that area that I gave you. You're then going to imagine a world where, for instance, uh, a, a restaurant, uh, you know, a restaurant where uh, waiters served, or diners served waiters. And you are going to, if you can see up here, you're going to come up with um, ins inspirations and ideas that come to mind thinking about that. It could be new services that might exist, it could be new activities that might exist, it could be new ways that the whole experience could be envisioned for the people eating in the restaurant, and you're going to do that twice. So you're going to do that under number three and number four. Is everybody kind of clear on that? Okay? So your area of focus is education. You remember all that you've done. You first did the head and heart exercise about water. Then you did the uh, problem, uh, the, I don't even remember, the uh, random objects exercise about cooking in the home. And then you just completed the provocation exercise about education. Now you're going to tie it all together. So now you're going to hold some concepts to help your persona. Excellent. Very good. So, so how, how, I really impressed by like the kind of range of concepts you all came up with. Um, you know, if I would have assigned you to just come up with a concept two and a half hours ago and gave you a half an hour, you probably wouldn't have ended up where you are. Um, so you can see sort of the value in kind of thinking broadly and diversely and trying to think really and truly outside of the box and really trying to push your brain mentally. How many of you are thoroughly exhausted right now? Oh, you can do some more, yeah? Okay, that's great. Um, so I really enjoyed watching what you guys um, came up with. What I am going to do is I'm going to, in the name of the class, um, open up a Kiva account and donate some money, $100 to some people in Guatemala for you. Um, I was, I thought it would be an appropriate sort of way to honor all the work that you guys did and sort of thinking about the people in Guatemala and some of the challenges that they have. Um, if any of you are familiar with kiva.org, um, you can look it up. I'm gonna set up something. I've gotta figure out how to do that. But you can go and check and see who money gets loaned to and you can hopefully follow it. Um, and uh, hopefully one of these days you'll have an opportunity to try to apply your design skills and your really um, great ability to think really conceptually about really hard problems really in the real world. 
And I hope that this experience sort of gave you some insights about how you might want to do that. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much to everybody.